Happy Sabbath, everyone. Just want you to know I'm already standing. <laughs> God is good. Praise God that there's some portion of the pulpit that's, that doesn't cover my, my very huge stature. That, that testimony, my dear friends, is, is more than enough to confirm that God is the one who is in charge. Amen? And throughout this week, we have seen God's hand. We have seen the Lord's goodness in every step of the way. And uh, I was just blown away. God is just so good. And I guess after Brother Jed's testimony, it's just proper to give the closing prayer. But I know Brother Jed would not let me get out of this church if I do the closing prayer now. So let me share with you what God has placed in my heart. Last February, the Lord called me to go to, to five country, a mission trip. I went to Vietnam, Thailand, South Korea, Japan, and the U.S. in two months. And uh, one thing that I have observed in these places, especially when I went to, to Korea and Japan, people there walk so fast. Isn't that, uh, Sue? They walk so fast. They even walk on the escalator. They could not wait for the escalator to bring them up. They walk. And there's a walking part section and there's a standing part section. And when I went to Japan, I've watched a lot of YouTubes that I was quite afraid when I was in that ramp when, when people are about to go inside the train because there was one YouTube uh, picture that I saw, a video, that they have train pushers to push people inside the train to make them fit. And people do not react. They just do like this until everybody is in the train. Sometimes, like, the train pushers has to pull their hands so that people could get in. And when I saw that, my dear friends, when I saw the sea of people in Tokyo, Japan, in the tram, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, can we survive? I was not afraid for myself. I was afraid for my friend's wife who was bringing a, a stroller with her son. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, this son would be squeezed. But by God's grace, we got through, and there was no train pushers that was needed. And one thing that I observed in this, in this two very busy, very industrialized country, a lot of people were busy, but a lot of people's faces were blank. Their faces were void. And as a Filipino, and for those of you who, who do not know, I'm a Filipino. That explains my size. For those of us, we want to go to these places. We desire to go to Japan. We desire to go to South Korea because we want to, to have a greener pasture in life. We want to have happiness. So that's why we desire to be in these places. And now I'm in this place, and I didn't see happiness. I didn't see peace. I didn't see void. And then it hit me because this country doesn't know Jesus. This country doesn't know Jesus. And then when I went to Thailand before going to South Korea, I went to Thailand for like two weeks, and I was filming a short devotional together with my friends. They brought me around beautiful places in Thailand. And there was this beautiful place. And when I look around, there was this pagoda, like seven, eight feet. And I was taking selfies in that pagoda. And I asked my friend, what is this? And he said, that is our cemetery. I said, What? A cemetery, for us, we have tombstone, they have pagodas, and it's cool looking. And I think, oh, wow, this is a cemetery. And I look around, a lot of pagodas, and it hit me. How many people went to their graves without knowing Jesus? As I look around, this busy people walking back and forth, I see their faces devoid of peace. I say their face is devoid of joy. And you know what's the saddest thing? I went to our church, and I see a huge similarity. I go to our church, I don't see peace. I don't see joy. And it's difficult to lift Christ up when our faces are like that. Do you want to have Jesus in your life? 
Do you want to know my Jesus? My dear friends, from somebody who's from the outside, I don't want to know the Jesus that you know. Why would I want something that doesn't make you joyful? Why would I want something that doesn't give you peace? And this situation right now, my dear friends, is one of the biggest hindrance that Christ is not lifted up. Remember one of our topics, especially last night. What does the Bible say? John 12, verse 32, If I be lifted up, I will what? Draw all men into me, including people living in Portland. Amen? The Lord says all. He did not say a few, some. He said all. But why don't we have that peace, that joy that God has promised? The Lord said in John 14, verse 27, Peace, I live with you. My peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither it be afraid. If Jesus has promised this peace, why is then not being seen in the faces of his people? And when you have peace, you have joy. Would you agree? With that being said, shall we kneel down for the prayer? Our great God, our dear loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you for giving us this beautiful gift, this gift of the Sabbath. And thank you so much, Lord, for giving us so many promises, so many gifts that you have listed down in this beautiful book of promise. But Lord, we don't seem to enjoy that gift. So today, dear Father, help us. Please, we are desperate. Help us to know you, that we may know that gift that we may know how to use that gift. And Lord, I pray that you please remove any hindrance, remove anything that hinders us from using that gift, from receiving that gift, that we may give glory to your name. Yes, Lord, that is our desire. Our desire to come here to church, not just to be soaked of the message, but Lord, we want to let Jesus shine in our lives. We want to lift you up higher than we have lifted you up before but we don't know, dear Father, how to. So please be with us today. May you give us knowledge and wisdom from above. May you pour upon us a full measure of your spirit. And Lord, once again, I echo what, what Brother Jed just prayed a while ago. Hide me behind the shadow of your cross, Lord, that I may not be seen nor be heard, or even the desire to be seen nor to be heard. Lord, please remove that, that you alone will be seen, will be heard, will be glorified and exalted. We ask this, dear Father, in the loving name of your Son, Jesus, all your children say, Amen. For some of you who have been here for the past, how many nights? Five nights? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five nights. You have heard about the testimony, how the Lord has led faithfully in my life and I'm glad to say that that life is very much available for each one of us. Amen? So in that, in that journey, by the way, I have been living by faith, no salary, no stipend, and I praise God for that for the past seven years, solid seven years of my life. Actually, at this month right now, October, it's my seventh year. God is good, amen? So actually this week, this is the last week of October, so this is, I did not even realize at first that I was already being called to do the missionary work. It's like I was trapped into it, but a wonderful trap. So, so through all those seven years, I'll just, I'll just share with you a few lessons that I've learned. So I'll give you now three reasons why we don't have that peace and joy that the Lord has promised. Because remember, the Lord has promised us peace. The Lord has promised us joy. And I like to read... Some article here from Science of the Times, October 4, 1883, paragraph 1, it says here, It is the privilege of every soul to seek and find peace in Christ. It is the privilege of whom? Every soul. Every soul. That includes me. That includes you. It is our privilege to, to what? To seek and find peace in Christ. Yet, this peace is granted upon conditions. 
we must surrender our will and ways and plans to the Lord. Amen? Again, your amen doesn't sound so convincing. Amen? I'm asking you to say amen not for the sake of the speaker, but for the sake that you will be convinced of what you are hearing. Amen? Because this is not my words. I'm just reading the inspired word of the Lord. Okay. And the problem is most of the time we are thinking, why is the work of the Lord not, lang- not, not going forward? Why is our church still stagnant for the past years? And sometimes we are seeking for programs. We are raising funds. We are doing this project and all. It doesn't amount to anything. Years after years after years, we're still the same. The same people that we see on this pew. The same people who, who occupies the same row, the same pew every single year. And then we begin to realize maybe we are not doing all the things that God is asking us to do. Maybe we are not lifting Jesus up. Or maybe He's not our priority. And I guess that is one thing right now that I'd like to emphasize. We plan for ourselves and not for the glory of God. That's the first one. Would you agree? We plan for ourselves but not for the glory of God. I'll ask you right now, even here inside this church, I know that there's a lot of things that's bothering our minds. If you agree, don't say amen. Say, "Mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, my dear friends, if there is something right now that if there is a text that you will receive concerning that thing that occupies your mind, I'm sure of it, you will get up from your pews and go attend that thing. The question right now is, what is our priority? Who is our priority? And in our plans, is God involved in our plans? And you know what? Before I could say, yes, God is involved in my plans. What is the role of God in your plans? And then I will answer now, yes, God is the true troubleshooter in my plan. But He is not the real purpose of my plan. My plan is not for the glory of God. My plan is for me. Did you get this? Sometimes we get, we get to say, no, my plan is for my family. Why do you want your family to, to succeed? Because every answer that you give points back to us, points back to you. We plan not for the glory of God, only for the glory of ourselves. And as a result, my dear friends, we don't have the peace and the joy that God is giving us. We have the gift, but we put the gift on the side. Why? We don't do the work that He is asking us to do. Why? We are too busy doing some other important stuff that we think that is more important than the work that the Lord has placed in our hearts. We have been pursuing these dreams all our lives. Where has it taken us? Are we happy? Are we joyful? Are we peaceful? If the answer is no, maybe, my dear friends, it's time to listen to the Lord. I like this wonderful quote here. It's found in Help in Daily Living, page 18, paragraph 2. It says here, Many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their heart, their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs. And this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Can you say, "Mm mm-hmm? Okay, let us remember that the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not wisdom to plan our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. Amen? Let us remember that the life of God's children here is just a pilgrim life. Sometimes we plan so much as if we will live here for eternity. Even if we become stones, we will not be eternal, my dear friends. Our eternity is in heaven. And why does not our plan become a heavenly plan? I'll ask you this question. Who is our ultimate example? Amen. Do you agree? 
Can I see it by the raising of hands? Oh, praise God, majority. Those who oppose, you don't have any word to say. <laughs> Christ is the only example that we have, amen? And if Christ does something His way, it should be our way as well. Listen, Christ in His life on earth made no plans for Himself. Can you say amen? That's a scared amen. My dear friends, life of Christ on this earth, He did not have plans for Himself. He accepted God's plan for Him, and day by day, the Father unfolded His plans. So should we depend upon God, that our lives may be the simple outworking of His will. As we commit our ways, He will direct our steps. What beautiful life would that be when you don't have a plan that God is the one leading your life? My dear friends, at first, it sounds scary, doesn't it? Huh? But you know what? It's, it's even scary. It gives you more anxiety because of your plans right now. Because you see that the economy, the political climate that is happening right now around us gives us a lot of concern. Will my plans ever come to fruition? Do you agree? But my dear friends, God's plans doesn't fail. Amen? And just imagine Jesus, Jesus ways. He does not have any plan. He's waiting for the Father's plan for him. And every day he comes to the Father. That's why Jesus' communion with his Father is so vital, is so important. He could not miss it. He would miss sleep. He would miss food, but not his communion with God. Because he needs to know what is your will for my life, Lord. And as a result, my dear friends, Christ made a lot of impact in this world in that one solitary life because it was not His plan. It was not His ways. It was the Father's ways. And that's the kind of life that God wants us to live. My dear friends, I'm not experiencing as much as Christ experiencing, but the little experience that I have, I will share with you. For the past seven years, God has been joyfully leading my life. God is so good. God never fails. When He says so, He does so. His word is sure. His word is truth. And, and just last December, last year, December 13 is my birthday. I was actually born on the Friday the 13th. <laughs> so people looked at me and said, yes, that explains it. <laughs> December the 13th, and I was flying from one place to place. The Lord just directed all, this, all these trips. And by the way, my dear friends, I do not present myself. I'll, I do not go like this, like, hey, Sue, can I speak to your church? I only wait for the Lord's leading because I don't want to go ahead of God. I always bring it to the Lord, and when the Lord confirms it, then I go forward. So I only know the Lord's leading. Not, and I will not know not until somebody invites me. And for the past seven years, the Lord has been booking almost every week, my dear friends. And last year, last part of October, the Lord brought me to India from Washington, D.C., and it was already cold, especially for a Filipino. I went to India, which is like the Philippines. It's quite hot. It's quite humid. After that, the Lord flew me back to New York and then to Colorado, in the mountains of Colorado. And then a few, and, and next week, the Lord flew me to Hawaii. Another warm. And then after Hawaii, the Lord flew me back to the U.S., to North Dakota. After North Dakota, the Lord flew me back to California. Another warm weather. And during that trip, it was my birthday. And I was asking, Lord, please, don't let me spend my birthday on the terminal but sunset came, it was already my birthday, I was still in the terminal. But when I arrived, when I arrived in, in California, I arrived at 11.45. I said, okay, in the world's time, it's not yet my birthday. And then I began to realize, oh, it's, it's my birthday back in the Philippines already. So my friends sang happy birthday to me when I arrived in their ho house. They talked to me and I was able to go to bed at around 1.30. And at 5 a.m., the Lord woke me up. 
after those travels, the Lord woke me up. And before I, I get so grumpy when, when I get to wake up at early in the morning that I don't have enough sleep. But this time, I know for a fact that the Lord wakes you up. You'll be excited. Amen? Just imagine the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of the universe wants to have a one-on-one -on -one time with you early in the morning. Will that excite you? So I sat down and I said, okay, Lord, what do you want me to dwell upon right now? And when I sat down, I opened my Bible and this thought came to my head, this song. And this song, I guess we have sang this song uh, in our worship. This song is in, goes like this. Count your blessings, name them one by one. You know that song? And the next line is, count your blessings and see what God has done. So I wrote down God's blessing. I just went to four categories and I could not go on because it really blew my mind. The first category was number of countries that the Lord has brought me within the 12 months. It's not that much. It's only four, four countries, including Philippines. I went to Philippines, Canada, India, and the U.S., and for the past six months that the Lord let me stay in the U.S., the Lord has brought me to 21 different states. And then I begin to realize all of these things happened only because of God's coordination. Amen? And the third one somehow blew my mind. The number of beds that I slept on. He might be wondering, why is he counting his bed? It actually started last 2015 while I was invited to take part in the GC session and I became part of the prayer team. In that two-week trip that I had during GC session, I discovered, oh, I, or I was already sleeping on eight beds. And I said, I, I should start documenting the number of beds that I, that I sleep on. And it was just for fun. And I took a selfie of my bed, bed number nine, and I posted it. And people begin to comment. And then I think, okay, this is, this is nice. And then one by one, I received messages from friends. Jem, thank you so much for your post. It reminds me that God is faithful to us every single step of the way. And then I created this album. It's called The Bed Blog. And I document every bed that I sleep on. And the title of that album is evidences of God's faithfulness. Amen? And for the 12 months, the Lord has provided 67 beds. And then I realized, how many weeks do we have in a year? Only 52. And then it hit me. Lord, you are providing more than one bed per week. Is God faithful, my dear friends? He is. And sometimes we limit Him. He, 67 beds in one year. And now the fourth and the last category, number of airplane rides. And when I got to the total, the Lord had me ride 65 airplane rides for the whole year. How much do I earn every month again? Zero. No stipend, no nothing. All God's provision. All God's leading. All God's plan. The question is, does it work? Oh, yes. Seven years is, I guess, a proof enough, solid enough, that God could take care of our lives, that God could take care of our ministries. Yes, I have to, I have to share more of that this afternoon. So, I begin to realize this beautiful verse that Sister Nettie read a while ago. What was that verse? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's just stay there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. How much do we trust God that He is, that he is faithful to what He has promised? That is the question. If we trust Him, He will show us that He is trustworthy. There's one weakness that God has, and I mentioned it last night. God cannot lie. It's actually not a weakness. Is the biggest strength of all. God cannot lie. Whatever He promises, He will fulfill. Whatever He says, He will do. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Friends, for the past seven years that I've been walking with God, I've tasted Him, and He's not just good. He's great. Amen? And this 
last counsel is actually the antidote for that one problem, the first problem that we have. What is the first problem again? We, we plan for ourselves and not for the glory of God. And this is the solution. Also in Help in Daily Living, page 19, paragraph 1. Too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. Too many in planning for a brilliant future make an utter failure. And you know what's the suggestion? Only five words. Let God plan for you. Can you say amen? Do you trust God's plan for you, my dear friends? Only five people trust God's plan for them. Do you trust that God could plan for you? Okay, let us move on. And sometimes we are so afraid to give up our plans because the moment we give up our plans, oh Lord, I'll sacrifice my plans for your plans. Let's talk about sacrifice. It says here, we are never called upon to make a real sacrifice for God. Many things that He asks to yield to Him. But in doing this, we are but giving up that which hinders us in the heavenward way. Even when called upon to surrender those things which in themselves are good, we may be sure that God is working out for us some higher good. My dear friends, sometimes we hang on so much with our earthly plans that God has wonderful plans in store for us. It says there, God is working out something for you that He will replace that something that's good to a higher good. Did you get this? When God is asking you to surrender something to Him, it means to say that you are ready for an upgrade. Can you say amen? Sometimes we hold on to our Nokia 5110 with that little antenna. And we don't want to give it to the Lord. Lord, I like the little antenna. I leave the little buttons, the yellowish screen. But God has in store for you, He's holding a box of iPhone X. 512 gigabytes. And you hang on to your 5110 reconditioned. And you don't want to let it go because you don't trust God with His plans. And you thought that it will be a sacrifice to give your plans to Him. My dear friends, sometimes we underestimate what God can do in our lives. We have lived our lives for what, 50, 60, 30 years and what have we gotten so far? I guess this is the time that God has to have a chance in our lives to show us what He can do in your life, in my life, in our life. Listen, I, I don't know if you know the song, He Surrendered All. This is another version of I Surrender All. Listen, by Alison Brooke, only Jesus He surrendered, only Christ laid glory down. He left heaven and his father put aside his royal crown. Only Jesus he surrendered, born a man and yet divine. He was tempted yet triumphant, came to heal your heart and mine. He surrendered all. He surrendered all. All for you and your salvation. He surrendered all. When we talk about sacrifice, my dear friends, that's why when we read a while ago, when we are called to make a sacrifice, we are not actually making a real sacrifice. Only Christ made a real sacrifice. What, it, what is God asking you is an upgrade. Amen? Can you call a sacrifice changing your Volkswagen into a Ferrari? That is not a sacrifice. That is not a sacrifice, and God is giving us more than a Ferrari. He's giving us salvation. He's giving us potential for joy, for you seeing souls saved to the life that He has given you. Let me read this. It will, rec it will require a sacrifice to give your plans or yourselves to God, but it is a sacrifice of a lower for the higher, the earthly for the spiritual, the perishable for the eternal. Is it really a sacrifice, my dear friends? And this is one amazing thing about our God. 
because when we give our plans to Him, we have His promises, we have Him. Then how do I direct my life now, Lord, if I don't have plans? Psalm 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with mine eye. Amen? If God is your guide, will you be lost? If God is your guide, my dear friends, will He reroute you into some place that's not your destination? Sometimes Siri gets us lost. Sometimes Google Maps gets us lost, but God will never get you lost. Amen? So what is the first thing that hinders us from receiving that joy and peace that God is giving us? We what? We plan for ourselves and not for the glory of God. And the solution is, let God plan for you. The next one, the second reason is, oh, we've discussed this during the week. This is like a summary of what we have discussed throughout the week. The second reason is, we rely so much on our own strength. Did you get this? What is our biggest hindrance again? Our strength. Sometimes we think that we are wise enough, that we are strong enough, that we really don't need Him. But my dear friends, that's when we begin to fall. I like this quote that I, that I read from my utmost for His highest. The greatest blessing spiritually is the knowledge that we are destitute. Is the knowledge that we are what? English is not my first language, so I looked up destitute, and it means nothing. Remember last time when I read that quote, man can accomplish how much without God? Can you say it with more conviction this time? How much? How much? Zero, nothing. You know why I made them repeat that again and again? Because most of the time we don't believe that. It's just a beautiful thought. It's just a cute quotation. You could post that in Facebook, but you don't really fully believe it. But my dear friends, that's reality. Without God, we are nothing. And sometimes when people look down on us and looks at us and thinks that we are nothing, we get offended. Don't we? When people tell you right now, you are nothing, what would your response be? You don't punch them. You say, praise the Lord. Thank you for reminding me. You are nothing. You're not taking it seriously. You are nothing. Okay, only five accepts that they are nothing. This church has a long way to go. You are nothing. Amen. Praise God. Without God, my dear friends, we are nothing. And the moment you realize that as soon as possible, then the fastest God could be your aid, could be your all, could be your strength, could be your everything. Just imagine that, my dear friends. Let me remind you of the quote that I read last few days ago. Men cannot depart from the counsel of God and retain their peace and restfulness of soul. There is no insanity so dreadful, so hopeless as that of following human wisdom and guided by the wisdom of God. It's a foolish act, my dear friends, to depart from the wisdom of God. It's foolishness to lean on your own strength where God is asking you, lean on me. Rely upon me. Remember, remember the story of Gideon? Gideon and his what? 300 men. Yeah, that's the real 300 story, not the 300 with Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler's 300, they're all dead. Gideon's 300, they were alive, amen? True story is better than fiction. And before the 300 was chosen, how many did they collect? Did they gather up? No? 22? Okay. Uh, going once? It's 32,000. 32,000. And the Lord says, that's still too many. 
that so many, and come to think of it, God says it's so many. These are not SWAT team. These are not Navy SEALs. These are trained to be construction workers. These are trained to be helpers. They're not trained for war. And they collected 32,000, and the Midianites could not even be numbered. And the Lord saw that the 32,000 is too much. They reduced it. The second reduction went to 10,000. And the Lord says, that's still too much. And Gideon was somehow getting confused. Lord, too much? The Midianites are so many. If you have your Bibles with you, please open it in Judges 7 verse 2. This is one of my favorite revelation here. Judges 7 verse 2. If you're there, say amen. If you're not there, you say have mercy. Okay, we'll wait for you. Okay, Judges 7 verse 2, it says here, It is God now speaking to Gideon. The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hands had saved me. Did you get this? This is one amazing thing, my dear friends. When you are fighting with God, when you are fighting for God and with God, Victory is assured. Victory is assured. The important thing is that you should remember, would you handle the glory? Or would you give the glory back to God? And this is the thing that the Lord was afraid of. He said, your man is too many. Because they might think that when the victory is given them, they will tell themselves it was because of our strength. It was because of us that we won this battle. And the Lord reduced them to how many? The final answer? 300. Can you get the percentage of 300 from the 32,000? You know how much percentage? Can you guess? 10%? It's barely 1%. It's barely 1%. It's actually hmm, 0.9375. So we could convert it into 1%, but it's a shameful thing. No, it's not 1%. God just wants to make, us, to make us realize that it's not because of the huge percentage that you play. It's the huge percentage that I play. Amen? One thing that I learned about God, my dear friends, if God can't shine through you, God cannot maximize you. God has to shine through you. God has to shine through you because if He cannot shine through you, my dear friends, it will debilitate us. We cannot handle glory. Only God can. Let's give Him the glory that he, we may receive this joy. Amen? God is so good. He is so protective of us that He doesn't want you to go down the drain. I love, I love going around places and meeting people and one time, while I was in, in Army Bible Camp in, uh, in Van, Texas, I met this boy, this, this very humble go boy. He's quite tall. Yeah, everyone for me is tall. He's from Colombia, and he plays good soccer. And he told me, Brother Jem, I don't know why the Lord had me injured because he's about to go to the junior, the professional junior league. And the Lord somehow... So I did not protect me in the field. I got injured, and now I'm back here in, in the U.S., and I'm not doing any football. I'm doing these things for the Lord. And the Lord somehow revealed to him that the Lord wants him higher. The Lord wants to use him much, much higher than, than just playing football. And this guy, I surprised the, their class, and I did a week of prayer in their academy. And, and when they saw me, we had this, this uh, dinner in the round table together with the boys. And the boys just told me, you know what, Brother Jem, Sam, Sam is the name of the guy. Sam here is the highest in our, in our canvassing work. And Sam, a humble guy this time, he said, oh, no, no, Brother Jem, it's all God. I said, no, 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 Brother Jem, he's just so modest. He just, he just sold like 20 to 40 books per day. 
and said, no, 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 Brother Jem, it's, it's all God. And they teased him, and they actually like him. Now, after the dinner, Sam walked with me, put his arms around me. He said, Brother Jem, I want to tell you what really happened during the canvassing work. I said, what? He said, you know that English is not my first language, and I have not sold anything in my life before, and I don't really know what to do. But just come to the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, please help me out here. I don't know how to do this. And said, Lord, I need to let you lead me to the person that needs this book. And I want you to put the words in my mouth because I don't know what to say. So every single day, the Lord just brings him to one person after another. And he sold tremendous number of books. And one time, while well, he was in one of the, the shopping area, I don't know it was, if it was Costco or Walmart or Target, but he was there in the parking lot. He was walking, and he said, Lord, please lead me into the right car. And the Lord led him to this car. And the moment he knocked, he was sure that he was in trouble. Because when he knocked at the window, he saw this guy holding a gun. And the guy rolled down the window and asked him, What do you want? And he was just shocked. He does not know what to say. And when he opened his mouth, these words came out, The Lord sent me here. And then this guy broke down. And then this guy said, You are the third person who's, who interrupted my plan to end my life. And I guess God really sent you here. And he talked to this guy. The guy began to open up. And later on, he was holding the guy's hand. And this guy gave his life to the Lord. He prayed for this guy. And after praying for this guy, this guy purchased a book from him. Have you seen that, that book, Peace in the Storm? Huh? There's, there's like a bird flying in that, in that cover. My dear friends, this happened not because Sam was brilliant in his craft. Sam became the top notcher of the group, not because he's really good at what he's doing. But what Sam discovered is that he could not do it without God. He could not rely on anything else except God. Can you say amen? My dear friends, that's a lesson for us. Lean not unto your own understanding. Amen? They all come together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. It does not stop there. The next counsel is what? Lean not. Do not lean on your own understanding. Lean where? Lean to the Lord. Lean on Him, my dear friends. Oh, Galatians 6 verse 3. Galatians 6 verse 3. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Wow. How many years have I, deceiving, have I been deceiving myself? If we think that we are something, when we are nothing, we deceive ourselves, my dear friends. Again, I'd like to read to you this beautiful quote from Living by Faith. When you are strong, then you are weak. And you are weak in the very points where your strength is. You are very apt to pride yourself in your strong points. You have nothing but weak points. Amen? It's a sad, sad reality, my dear friends, but this is a gift right now that is being opened to us. You have nothing but weak, weak points. Why? Because apart from God, we are nothing. Apart from God, we are nothing. This, is sound, this sounds so depressing, but my dear friends, God's strength is being manifested in our weakness. The moment we run to Him, it's not your strength anymore because your strength is very little compared to the strength that God wants to display in your life. This is what the enemy has been trying to do. He wants you to think that you are strong because the moment you think that you are strong, you become a prey to him. The moment you think that you are strong, you are an easy target for the enemy. 
But the moment you begin to realize, without God, I cannot do this. And when you hang on to the Lord, He could not touch you. He could not shake you. The Lord wants us to rely on Him. Absolute reliance is what we need. Amen? Absolute reliance is what, we, what He requires, and absolute reliance is what we desperately need, my dear friends. Self-sufficiency is a curse. Listen to this. There is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride and self-sufficiency. Of all sins, it's the most hopeless. Christ Subject Lesson, page 154. When we are self-sufficient, we would not have a need of God. Do you agree? If this church is self-sufficient, we would not be spending time in week of prayer. Why? Because we're rich. We're talented. We have all the experience. But praise God, this church sees its need. And a beautiful promise in Desire of Ages, page 300, paragraph 1, it says, From the soul that feels its need, nothing is withheld. Can you say amen? From the soul that feels its need, nothing is withheld. The question is, how much do you need God in your life? How much do you need God in your marriage? How much do you need God in your family? How much do you need God in your ministry? How much do you need God in this church? If you need God this much, then this is how much that you'll receive from God. But if you need God this much and this much, and this much, then that's how much you receive from God. From the soul that feels its need, nothing is withheld. What is holding back God from us giving His all is our need of Him. Most of the time we ask for this, Lord, please give me this, give me blessing, answer this prayer, give me a job, Lord, please give me this, give me funding. When we should be praying, Lord, please increase my need of you. My dear friends, if you have God, you have all. If you have God, you have everything. You don't need funding. You need Him. You need Him more than the funding. If you have God, if you are so in love with God, the pastor would not break his voice in campaigning to give to the Lord. People will come here and the pastor will say, slow down, slow down. We don't have enough storage for the gifts. It should be like that, amen? Remember Moses when they built the sanctuary. Moses said, stop giving, please. That's what happens when we have God with us. We don't need a lot of things. We only need one. We need God. And what stops us from needing Him is our so-called strength. It's so-called self-sufficiency. That should be broken, my dear friends. God wants to give Himself to this church. Let's need Him like we ought to need Him, my dear friends. We could not do this on our own. We need Him. You need Him in your personal life. You need Him in your school. You need Him in your work. You need Him in your marriage. You need Him in this church. He has to shine. If the need for God increases, my dear friends, Pentecost will happen. Pentecost will happen, my dear friends. Lean not on your own understanding. The third one. Yes, we are ending. This is the last one. The third one. Before I mention the third one, I'd also like to, to mention the last phrase. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and what? Lean not in your own understanding. Are these two powerful lines, aren't they? Did you agree? These are two powerful lines, so powerful that we often forget the third line. In all our ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct our path. As important as the first two lines, the third line is equally as important. And the third the third reason 
Before I mention that, I'll give you this illustration. Remember the Israelites when they crossed the Red Sea? And they were about to cross to, to get to Canaan. Before they get to Canaan, what did they do? They sent what? They sent spies. Who told them to send spies? Open your Bibles in Numbers 13, verse 1 and 2. Numbers 13, verses 1 and 2. I like to hear the Bibles being open. Let me read it. And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan. Who gave the command? And the Lord said to Moses, Send thou men that they may search the land. You know what, my dear friends? This thought here actually made me question God, especially in my in my youthful years, in my rebellious mindset, I was thinking, Lord, why would you ask this faithless generation to send spies? You know what's going to happen? The ten of them, God knows what's going to happen before it happens. Would you agree? And by asking the Israelites to send men, and when they come back, ten of them will report negative report. And of course, this is a faithless generation. They will back out. And I'm thinking, Lord, you put them in a trap. Am I right? Don't worry, that's not the conclusion of, of this morning's talk. I was just trying to, trying to make things right in my mind. You put them in a trap. And then I closed the book. I was so impatient. And I said to the Lord, you are unfair. And it took me a while. And I doubted God's leading. And lo and behold, God is so patient with me. But when I opened one time the spirit of prophecy, spirit of prophecy is really a gift, isn't it? That's why it's called the gift of the spirit of prophecy. And when I opened the spirit of prophecy in Science of the Times, September 2, 1880, paragraph 1, Science of the Times became my devotional reading right now. I like, I like reading this because it's just like full of knowledge and wisdom. Listen. The proposition to send men to search the land was first made by the people. Did you get this? It shocked me. The proposition to send men to search the land was first made by the people. I'm thinking, are they contradicting the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? And while I was in Andrews, while I was sharing this message, after I, I stepped down, a friend of mine approached me. He is the great, 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 great grandson of Ellen G. White, Justin. And then Justin Tarosian told me, Hey, Brother Jem, there is a verse here that somehow supports what, you are, what you're talking about. And we are studying that verse this week. And then your quote just made it, made it really powerful. Listen, Deuteronomy 1 verse 22. This time, Moses was giving a message to the people before they surround Jericho. And Moses reminded them of what happened before they reached Canaan. And listen, Deuteronomy 1 verse 22, it says there, And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, that they shall search out the land. Did you get this? So whose idea was it? It's man's idea. It's Israelites' idea. It was not God's idea. Now listen, whatever you're doing right now, put it down. The text message, it could wait. Listen. But as it pleased Moses, he presented the matter before the Lord and obtained his consent for them to go. The result was disaster and destruction. The result was disaster. And destruction. Even Moses was convinced by the people to present this to the Lord. And listen to this thought. Had they waited for the Lord to say, go forward and follow the divine leader, they would have seen the majesty and glory of God as verily as they saw it 40 years afterwards. Did you get this? If they only waited for the Lord... 
if they set aside their ideas and just came to the Lord and asked the Lord, what would you have us do, Lord? They would have heard the Lord said, just go forward. And they would have received the glory that they have received after 40 years. My dear friends, any idea that is not the Lord's idea, even though how good that idea is, is disastrous. Did you get this? Any idea, no matter how good it is, searching the land is a good idea. That's what you usually do. That's a logical way to do when you, in, when you conquer the land. You have to search, you have to know, you have to size up your opponent. That is a good idea, but was it God's idea? No, my dear friends, it's their idea. Any idea apart from the Lord is disastrous. And what caused them that idea? 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. It's not just 40 years, it cost them their lives. None of them ever crossed Canaan. Even Moses, who accepted that idea. Did you get that, my dear friends? And when I look at our lives right now, we have been wandering in the wilderness. We have been wandering in the wilderness. Why? Because we are so full of ideas. We are so brilliant with our ideas that we don't come to the Lord. Lord, as a church, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Have we done that? Have we been desperately begging God, show us what to do? My dear friends, this is high time right now. This is high time to seek God's leading in our lives. There's no time to waste, my dear friends. You've seen what's going to happen. And even the Lord is, is not going to come in 10 years. In, but I don't know if it's going to take 10 years. It always pays to put the Lord's ideas first. Amen? We have wasted so much time running our own idea and we have been running around in this wilderness for too long, more than 40 years. And every time we have a centennial year, we celebrate. Yes, 100 years of getting lost in the wilderness. It's a sad thing, isn't it? It should be 100 years of mourning. It should be 100 years of soul-searching, Lord, what we have done wrong. Why are we still here? What have we not done, O oh Lord? Why are we still here? The third reason is that we do not wait on God. That is the reason we don't have peace and joy, even in this church, even in our church, wherever I go, no exception. I could feel the void. I could see the void. And all of us are in this boat. All of us are in this boat. And all of us should seek the Lord's will, should seek the Lord's idea before giving our own. Amen? Every time we have an idea, we should come to the Lord, plead before Him, fast before Him. Is this what you want us to do, Lord, or this is just me speaking here? We need to know that it is God's will. We need to know that it is God's ways. I'm about to close. Don't worry. David had sought and obtained divine instruction. Remember David? David the king? David the shepherd boy? He is the only king recorded in the Bible that has not faced any defeat. Did you get that? He has not faced any defeat. And learn from David. Listen. David had sought and obtained divine instruction and he obeyed the voice of the Lord and God gave the glory and gave the glory of his success to the Lord. He had delivered the enemies of Israel into his hands. Oh, that the people of God at all times in every extremity would seek the Lord. We need to pray more and trust less in our own power. The promise is given that those who commit their way to the Lord shall be directed in the path of righteousness. If we commit, the Lord will direct. And even Gideon, my dear friends, listen. How Gideon managed to win the battle. 
the Lord Himself directed Gideon's mind. Isn't this amazing? The Lord Himself directed Gideon's mind. Isn't He faithful when He promised, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you will go. I will guide you with mine eye. My dear friends, who needs the Lord's guidance here? Who is desperate for the Lord's guidance in their lives? Praise God. We need to be desperate for that. The enemy is so afraid that when we submit ourselves to God, we become like this. Listen, as the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Can you say amen? Again, I searched out the word omnipotent. Omnipotent means almighty, possessing unlimited power. This is why, my dear friends, the Lord is asking us absolute reliance, complete reliance on me. Not on anything else, not on anyone's, not on your strength, not on your plans. Wait on me. There's one person who could not wait on God. And I have seen, I have seen the stories again and again, how people in the Bible fail because they fail to wait on God. Abraham, remember Abraham, the father of the faithful. It says there, it says there in the spirit of prophecy, it is because that Abraham moved ahead of God that he was allowed to experience the greatest trial that man could ever handle. Did you get that? It is because that he went ahead of God. He did not listen to God. He did not wait. He listened to the loudest voice beside him, his wife. He listened to Sarah. And as a result, he was tested beyond any human could handle. But by God's grace, he got through. Remember Jacob and Rebecca, his mom? The Lord has promised that Jacob will receive the, the biggest blessing. And yet, Rebekah did not trust God to perform that. He made his way possible and deceived her husband, Isaac. As a result, my dear friends, she was never able to see her son again. And Jacob became a wanderer, and he was deceived as well so many times. Another person who can't wait for God, Moses. He was already given the promise that he would be the the deliverer of Israel. But he went ahead of God because he, he studied in Harvard during that time. It's like the top university in his time. And the Lord somehow rebuked him when he did his own way. And the Lord brought him to SWC, South Wilderness College. <laughs> and then he taught him the ways of humility ways of waiting on God. And you know what? Moses was one life as well. That when I was younger, when I was in my rebellious mindset, made me question the character of God. Remember Moses? The most humble man, the most patient man, and yet only one little sin. And Jesus and God did not allow him to cross Canaan. And I was thinking, Lord, this is unfair. You are unfair. And I was reading this, these verses. And then when I got through the spirit of prophecy, you know what? Just imagine, he let Moses stand in that, in that mountain. Let him see Canaan. And I'm thinking, Lord, do you love to torture people? You will not allow him to cross Canaan. And yet, you ask him to go and die alone? and see Canaan before he dies? I'm thinking, this is like a hungry kid, a very st a starving kid, and you wave a burger in front of that kid. Veggie burger, of course. <laughs> and I was thinking, Lord, that's cruel. And I closed my book. I did not wait on God. And then God is so patient. At one time, I was reading the story of Moses. And this is what I've seen. Oh, 
Moses, listen. And when I encountered this, it really pierced, pierced my heart again. Because, listen to this. He was beyond temptation. And there was a mystery. He was not beyond temptation, I mean. And there was a mystery and awfulness about the scene before him, for which his heart shrank. He was in the full vigor of health with all his powers in active exercise. Did you get this? Moses was still strong. He could fight any battle. He could join the army. He could outrun some kids, some young people. His, whole big, his, his strength in full vigor, in full exercise. And he stood there just looking at Canaan. And what did Moses say? Nothing. What did Moses do? Nothing. He just waited on God. He just waited on God. And I was reading it through, and then I begin to see what happened. The Lord opened before Moses the panorama of everything. He let Moses see the Israelites conquering Canaan. He let Moses see all the ups and downs of the Israelites. He let Moses see Jesus came down as a babe in a manger. He let, Je he let Moses see how Jesus selected the disciples, how Christ was, was taken up to heaven. And then Moses at that time, he was, he was wondering, who's going to take care of my body? I just buried my brother. And now no one's about to bury me. But he did not ask that question. He surrendered it to the Lord. And when he died, the angel buried him. And when he died, Satan came and claimed his body. And Jesus came down. Jesus came down. You read that in Jude. And Jesus used the word, the name Michael. You know what? Michael is only used when, when Jesus is ready for war. Huh? And Satan came and claimed the body of Moses. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus did this. Talk to the hand. <laughs> Jesus said, he is mine. Jesus said, he is mine. And just imagine, just imagine you are Moses. Friends, just imagine you are Moses. The Lord resurrected him. When he opened his eyes, he was not in earthly Canaan. He was in heavenly Canaan. I thank God that I waited. I thank God that I read through the whole story. I blame God. I said, you are unfair. You did not let Moses go to the promised land. And if you ask Moses right now, which promised land would, would he choose? Of course, he would choose that promised land. And this is the problem with us. This is the problem with me. Most of the time, our dreams are too low. We only dream for this world, but God's dream for us are way, 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 way bigger than our dreams. And we don't trust God with our dreams. We hang on to our puny dreams, and we let the grandest dreams of the Lord for us just passes us by. My dear friends, let's start dreaming big for God. Amen? God desires us to dream big for Him. Relinquish your dreams, my dear friends. Just give up your dreams and ask God, Lord, what dreams do you want me to dream? What plans do you want me to plan? I just give you everything.